Welcome to Strange Reads and welcome inside the machine. I'm David and with me today is my friend and author Iris Lavelle who's nominated today's story which is... It's The Machine Stops by M. Forster. E.M. Forster was regarded as a humanist writer, depicting the struggle for personal connections despite the restrictions of the society in which people lived. Most famous for his novels A Room with a View, Howard's End and A Passage to India, today's short story showcases his talents as a science fiction writer. Edward Morgan Forster was born on the 1st of January 1879 at 6 Malcolm Place, Dorset Square, London. He was the only child to parents Alice Clara Lily Forster and Edward Morgan Llewellyn Forster, who was an architect. Sadly, his father passed away from tuberculosis just before Forster was two years old. His mother and great aunt took him to live in Rook's Nest House on Western Road, Stevenage, in Hertfordshire, where he lived from 1883 until 1893. When only seven years old, Edward inherited a large sum of money from his great aunt, equal to approximately £950,000 in today's money. Later in life, this fortune enabled him to pursue a writing career without having financial concerns. As a young boy, Forster attended Tonbridge School in Kent. Reports state he held no fondness for the institution. Continuing his education between 1897 to 1901, he attended King's College, Cambridge. Here, he relished broadening his intellectual pursuits as he studied a diversity of cultures. At college, he became a member of a discussion society called the Apostles. They met in secret. He and many of the members went on to form the Bloomsbury Group, which included notable authors such as Virginia Woolf. Finishing university, he gained a BA with second class honors in classics and history, after which he traveled extensively in Europe with his mother. In 1905, the author Elizabeth von Arnhem employed him as a tutor in Germany for several months. Upon return to England, Forster and his mother moved to Weybridge in Surrey. Here, he would write all six of his novels. The Machine Stops, first published in the Oxford and Cambridge Review in 1909, is Forster's only foray into science fiction. In 1916, much to Forster's horror, World War I conscription regulations demanded all men aged between 18 and 41 to be enlisted. Forster hoped his previous work for the Red Cross might excuse him not to be. He was summoned for a medical. However, to his delight, he was deemed medically unfit and subsequently took a position in Alexandria as a chief searcher for the British Red Cross. The five novels published in his lifetime were Where Angels Fear to Tread, The Longest Journey, A Room with a View, Howard's End, and in 1924, A Passage to India, for which he won the James Tate Black Memorial Prize for Fiction. His novel Maurice was published posthumously in 1971. In the 1930s and 40s, Forster worked as a broadcaster on BBC Radio, where he became friends with George Orwell. From 1925 until 1945, he lived with his mother at West Hackhurst, Abinger Hammer in Surrey. The novelist met police officer Robert Buckingham at a party on the day of the 1930 Oxford vs Cambridge boat race. For the next 40 years, they maintained a love triangle with Robert's wife May. Forster's mother died on March 1945. The following year, he moved to nine Arlington Park mansions in Chiswick. Here, he stayed until 1961. E.M. Forster received many awards in his lifetime, including a knighthood, which he declined in 1949. He became president of the Cambridge Humanist Association in 1959 and remained so until his death. E.M. Forster died from a stroke aged 91 on the 7th of June 1970. He passed away at the Buckingham's residence, with May acting as a nursemaid. In 1975, his ashes were mingled with those of Robert Buckingham and scattered in the Rose Garden at Coventry's crematorium. Global warming, an environmental apocalypse, religious authority and an omnipotent technology running every facet of human lives. And it was written in 1909. Press the subscribe button and sit back in your armchair. The machine will take care of the rest. But beware, there are spoilers ahead. Chapter 1. The Airship The story begins in a small hexagonal shaped yet otherwise featureless room. The only furniture is a reading desk next to an armchair. And in this chair sits a swaddled lump of flesh, a woman about five feet high with a face as white as a fungus. It is to her that the little room belongs. Her name is Vashti. The conditions are calm and ideal. An electric bell rings and Vashti sees it's her son, Kuno. He's calling from the other side of the earth. She isolates herself, meaning no one else can contact her, and opens the blue optic plate. 
Be quick, Kuno. Here I am in the dark, wasting my time. He tells her he wishes to see her face to face, not via the machine. Vashti reprimands him, reminding him he mustn't speak ill of the machine. He insists he has something important to tell her. She describes her reticence towards making the journey. The view from an airship is a horrible brown earth. Vashti states she doesn't get ideas in an airship, an activity that's important to her, society, and the machine. Kuno holds different ideas, though. He proclaims the airship gave him ideas about constellations, about a man carrying a sword to kill other men and animals. It does not strike me as a very good idea but it's certainly original. Kuno declares he wants to be like their ancestors and see the stars from the surface of the earth, where he would need a respirator due to the conditions. It is contrary to the spirit of the age. Vashti is keen to dissuade her son. Do you mean by that, contrary to the machine? Kuno ends the call, leaving his mother feeling lonely. Eventually, Vashti continues with a day delivering a 10-minute lecture on music during the Australian period. Neither she nor her audience stirred from their rooms. Afterwards, she watched a lecture about the sea. Such presentations gave her ideas uh, about the sea. At bedtime, Vashti consults the book of the machine. It tells her which buttons to press for different services. It also tells her the airship departure times. She presses one button and the wall swings apart, revealing a curved tunnel. It's quite confronting to the woman. In a few conversations with Kuno, she insists that she is unable to visit him. However, memories of his birth, an immediate removal and assignment to the other side of the earth, slowly change her mind. The horror of direct experience returns when Vashti sees the vast flank of the airship. The smells, not good or bad, are confronting. She has to submit to glances from the other passengers. It's an anxious affair. Once on board, She's afraid. Oh, machine. She murmurs and caresses the book of the machine for comfort. They fly westward. Vashti gains a few hours of uneasy slumber. She wakes to see the unfamiliar glow of dawn creeping through a floor in the ship's blinds. She suffers a spasm of horror when sunlight touches her face. The attendant is equally horrified, yet is not responsible for adjusting the blind. With the assistant, Vashti views the Himalayas. It was supposed that no one but the gods could exist above their summits. How we have advanced because of the machine, they agree. Before Vashti asks the window to be covered, as the mountains give her no ideas. Chapter 2 the mending apparatus. On landing, Vashti arrives at her son's room. Kuno states he has been threatened with homelessness, which means death, as the victim is exposed to the surface air and it kills him. Kuno says he's already been to the surface using a respirator, but he didn't apply for an aggression permit. The tremendous thing has happened and they have discovered me. In their argument, Kuno accuses his mother of having a religious relationship with the machine. Fear and superstition have been destroyed by the machine, so Vashti takes offence. To prepare for the journey to the surface, he needed to exercise. In modern society, a muscular build is viewed as a demerit. Once again, Vashti expresses displeasure with her son. In his desperation to reach the surface, Kuno found a shaft leading up from a railway tunnel. By odd fortune, he opened it and an event blew him up onto the surface. Lying in a hollow on the surface, his respirator dancing in an upward jet of air, he stared at the sky. Air from the vent fell into the hollow and protected him from the harsh surface air. Kuno is passionate about what he saw on the surface. Cannot you see that it is we that are dying? And that down here, the only thing that really lives is the machine. The venting air slowed down and Kuno's respirator fell to the ground. The gap in the tunnel had been fixed. The mending apparatus was after me. Out of the shaft, a long white worm glided over the moonlit grass and attacked him, wrapping around his legs. But as he was dragged into the shaft, his head banged against the ladder. I woke up in this room, Kuno says. I've seen God in the twilight. She came to my help when I called. Vashti decides her son is mad and leaves. She never saw his face again. Chapter 3 the homeless. In the years that followed this escapade, respirators were banned. Knowledge would rely on pre-existing lectures. Beware of first-hand ideas, exclaimed the most advanced lecturers. A lecture given on this approach received tremendous applause. Terrestrial facts must be ignored. The second great development was the re-establishment of religion. The machine feeds us, clothes us, and houses us. It is the friend of ideas and the enemy of superstition. The machine is omnipotent, eternal. Blessed is the machine. People worship the machine differently. One would be chiefly impressed by the blue optic plates, another the mending apparatus, others by the book. Anyone not accepting the minimum, known as undenominational mechanism, risked homelessness. Year by year, the machine became serviced by increased efficiency and decreased intelligence. No one knew how the whole machine worked. Those master brains had perished. Humanity, in its desire for comfort, had overreached itself. It had exploited the riches of nature too far. Quietly and complacently, it was sinking into decadence. Vashti lived peacefully until the final disaster. On occasion, she requested euthanasia, but the machine refused it. One day, she was astonished to receive a message from her son. She'd heard indirectly that he had been transferred 
transferred from the northern hemisphere to the southern, indeed to a room not far from her own. Kuna refused to visualize on the blue optic plate. Speaking out of the darkness with solemnity, he says, the machine stops. Vashti thinks his comet is ridiculous, and she says so to her friends. They discuss some defects with the music, but it's nothing the mending committee couldn't fix. Eventually, she makes formal complaints about the music, but only receives assurances that a solution is forthcoming. They start to accept the faults as part of the melody. They also accept mouldy artificial fruit, stinky bathwater, defective rhymes in the poetry, and ultimately, a lack of beds when summoned. There is a cry for responsible parties to be punished with homelessness. Some lecturers suggest it's all the will of the machine and received applause via the portals, which still worked. And until it didn't. Even the hum of the machine's activity ceased. The profound shock almost killed her. She stumbled forward and opened the door of her cell. Now the curving tunnel bustled with people, screaming, fighting, yelling for euthanasia, respirators, or blaspheming the machine. Behind the uproar, the silence persisted. She closed the door and waited for the end. In a final horror, the light started to ebb. She kissed the book and pressed button after button. Once unable to see the features of her room, she reopened the door. Outside in the dark, people were dying in their hundreds. Where are you? She sobbed. His voice in the darkness said, Here. Is there any hope, Kuno? She crawled over the bodies of the dead. Quicker, he gasped. I'm dying. Kuno talks of how they have recaptured their lives in the manner of kings from Viking England. As he spoke, the whole city was broken like a honeycomb. An airship had sailed in through the vomitory. It crashed downwards, exploding, rending gallery after gallery. For a moment they saw the nations of the dead and, before they joined them, scraps of the untainted sky. As readers, we often look towards science fiction for potential futures. The Machine Stops presents as the quieter cousin of 1984 or Brave New World. It's over a hundred years since E.M. Forster published his story. Could what was once speculative fiction now be seen as a new dystopian normal? Touted as inspiration for novels such as George Orwell's 1984 and Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, The Machine Stops is an incredible work of terrifying premonitions. But what seeds were planted in Forster's imagination to create such a tale? H.G. Wells and Jules Verne are known as champions of scientific romances, a progenitor of the science fiction genre, and both were on Forster's reading list. Forster is quoted as referencing one of H.G. Wells' Heavens as inspiration for The Machine Stops. While he's not specific about which story, The Time Machine certainly has elements of insight into an unpleasant future for humankind. Henri Fermat, a French aviator, made a complete circular flight of 1,030 meters in 1 minute 14 seconds on the 10th of November 1907 at Issy in France. This was the first time a European aeroplane had completed a full circle, and the first time that an aeroplane other than a Wright Brothers one had stayed in the air for longer than a minute. Forster saw Fermat's daring flight as proof that machines could do anything and that we would soon live in a world where everything was done and controlled by machines. In the COVID era, there's a sense of safety to staying indoors. Face-to-face -face contact is something to be wary of. Work can be completed online, and lectures, received on any TED Talk favourite subject, can be watched from the comfort of your own utopian home. Different religions regard each other with derision, while new religions are invented. We can catch up with friends over Zoom. Are the comforts we pursue turning us into swaddle lumps of fungus white flesh? I get the irony that our video is being presented to you on YouTube. All of this while the earth bakes brown under an atmosphere altered by our own excesses. I can't help but escape marvelling at E.M. Forster's foreshadowing. In 1909 he created a dystopian future. Today many of his fictitious society's features are accepted as commonplace. And are we concerned at all? Thanks for nominating such a thought-provoking story, Iris. It's super interesting and I'd never even come across a story before. And it's also great to have a co-host half my workload. Iris's book, Elsewhere in Success, is not available anymore. It's sold out. Well done. Um, but it, you can still get it as an e-book. So what's the elevator pitch, Iris? Well, as you can see, it's got a nice dog on the front. <laughs> it's all about the dog. <laughs> if you like dogs. Sorry. Well, it's a domestic drama about people living lives in quiet desperation. And but there dog. is some humour in there and a dog. And a dog. She can also be found hosting the Australian Baby Boomer podcast. I'll put the links below. Let us know in the comments what your favourite dystopian tale is and discover more speculative fiction tales in one of our other episodes. For everything else, our social media links are on screen. And remember, keep it strange.